John Cassavetes was best recognized for his role in The Dirty Dozen and Rosemary's Baby, but people who love film know him as one of the forerunners of independent filmmaking. Martin Scorsese wrote, when I hear the term independent filmmaker, I think of John Cassavetes. He was the most independent of them all. Criterion has just released five of his films in an eight-disc box set. One of now three of Cassavetes' contemporaries, his wife and muse, actor Gina Rollins, one of his longtime collaborators, Ben Gazzara, and his friend, filmmaker Peter Bogdanovich. I am pleased to have them. I want just to do a couple of things here. It's just simply Peter has a book also in which he has a series of conversations called Who the Hell's In It? And Ben has a book that's been well-reviewed about acting called In the Moment. And then I come to this, this remarkable collection. Who put this together? I mean, how did this Criterion. come about? This is from Criterion. And they have an awfully good reputation for, for doing quality work. And they, they went over it really very carefully. And it has uh, Charles Kisseljak's yeah. um, documentary right. in it, too. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tracing the life and all of, yeah. all of that experience. You were with John Cassavetes 20 years? Oh, no, we were married 35 years. Tell me about it. I really wouldn't know where to start. Well, start somewhere when you, when you first met him. Well, I first met him in, at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, and I had just come from Wisconsin. And all I knew was that I never wanted to get married, I never wanted to have children because I knew that was the one thing that could stop an actress in her tracks. And uh, I just wanted to be on stage. I never wanted to make movies. Talk about your master plans. <laughs> and I saw him one day. He was just back there visiting with some friends. I saw him in a green room, and I thought, oh, shoot. Um, so I avoided. Oh, I shoot. avoided. <laughs> Is that right? Oh, boy, there goes everything. Because your every dream, yeah. every plan yeah. would go everything. out the window. So I avoided him for about six months. And then he saw me in a play at the school. And he came backstage, and that was that. What was it about John? Intensity? Well, yes. He had, he had uh, a deep intensity, a deep feeling. He, he just had such emotional depth that uh, it wasn't, it's not something that you run into normally, is yeah, it? No. And we all felt it. But with that, he wasn't afraid of making a fool of himself. No. He, had a, he, he would uh, do belly flops, he'd do uh, uh, cartwheels. Uh, uh, we did the Johnny Carson show. I'm talking, uh, uh, think, thinking I was making a valid intellectual point. Yeah. He jumped on my back. <laughs> he thought it was, we were just getting too too highfalutin. Yeah. Bring yeah. it down, you know, yeah. bring it down. Yeah. Uh, he was terrific. He was terrific. Peter and you see that in his, if I may, just one second. You see that in the way he attacks scenes between people. That you, where you think the scene is going to be absolutely dramatic and tear filled, John will switch it and start people laughing uh, uh, hysterically at a moment you, you, you would never expect it because he was always looking for the opposites. Yeah. He was always looking for the mix in life. That life was not just one color. It was, uh, a human being was filled with many, many, many colors. And you can see that he, he knew how to do that. But why was his work difficult sometimes for audiences to get their head around? Well, you know, um, there's a scene in Minnie and Moskowitz, a picture that John made with Jenna, in which Jenna has a speech in which she says, you know, the movies set you up. And no matter how smart you are, they set you up. And you expect this and you expect that, you expect that. And it's a great, I, I'm paraphrasing it, but he says, you know, uh, you, you, I never met somebody like Charles Boyer. She says, I never met Humphrey Bogart. They don't exist. Yes. But the movies set you up to believe these things. And John, John's movies were didn't set you up. They try to tell you the truth. And uh, the truth uh, isn't something that people always want to see. I think of all the, his contemporaries, uh, John is the only director who I could say was a poet. He, he, he understood what people were about, and he tried to put that on the screen in an unvarnished way. Which doesn't mean that he himself didn't like films that were sort of fantasy. 
I mean, he had a great line about uh, Capra. He said, maybe there never was an America. Maybe it was all Capra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he loved Capra, and he had a great sense of humor. I mean, Jerry Lewis told me he, he was an easy guy to make laugh. Are there any misconceptions that come to mind when people think about John Cassavetes' films? Well, one of the biggest ones is that they're all improvised, you know. I asked Peter Falk once, I said, is it true that this is improvised? And Peter said, who could, who could improvise the lines this good? <laughs> you know. No, but yeah. I think except for parts of Shadows, I don't think any of them were improvised. John wrote One them. scene in Husbands, the drinking scene, was, was improvised. But, he let uh, it play. He let it play, that's yeah. right. You would know how much of it was improvised. Shadows was entirely improvised, the first one. I think that's why, why everyone thought, thought the rest yeah. of them were. But then the rest of them were tightly scripted, except there would always be mm. a scene or yeah. one scene, and he wouldn't tell you what was going to happen or what. It would just spring it on you. And, and so there would always be an improvised scene, and that, they were fun because you never knew when they were coming. He also, uh, did, he, you know, he also didn't... Uh, didn't always tell the actors what everybody was going to do in this scene. I only was in briefly in opening night at the end. <clears throat> and John just said to me, just go over to Jenna behind the curtain and tell her she was terrific in the show. That's all he told me. He didn't tell me that there's going to be an awful lot of other things going on. You know, I just, uh, and then somebody comes over and says, excuse me, and interrupts me. I didn't know any of this was going to happen. John uh, drove Peter Falk crazy. Because <laughs> Peter Falk wants to be directed. He wants specific direction, and John wouldn't give you a specific. John would no, avoid it at all. He wouldn't tell you what to do. He wouldn't tell you where to sit. He wouldn't tell you where to go. But he set the environment for it to happen. Peter didn't like that. So Peter would, would, would get him and say, look, John, now you tell me what to do. And then John would talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. <laughs> and Peter would turn to me and say, do you know what this man is saying? <laughs> and I say, yeah, he wants you to go over there. Yeah. He wants you to go over there, Peter. Well, if he wants me to go over there, why doesn't he tell me to go over there? <laughs> and it was very terrific. Now, uh, how close were you and John and Peter? Very close. My actually, brother? actually, well, that's the part of working with John. I never had that experience, you see. That was the first time I worked with him. Uh, in, in creating the friendship, in rehearsal, and in the shooting of that film, we became friends, deep, deep friends. John deeper than Peter because I saw, I continued to see John after the event far more than Peter. And we, 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 we the, the friendship just deepened. And I made another film with John, as you saw, uh, Killing of a Chinese Bookie. And uh, his death really, uh, as I write about in my book, uh, really uh, was the precursor to a very bad depression. On your part? Yeah talking about friendship and the impact of right. the loss of it, etc. But take a look at this. This is Peter Falk talking about John. I mean, John's approach to making a movie, John's approach to filming, John's approach to acting was all so new. It was all so original. It was all so unfamiliar. Uh, and I was fighting it, you know, and I wanted to do what I was used to doing. Because during Husbands, I could kill him. You know, I, know. I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to kill him. I wanted to kill him. I didn't understand what now he was doing. I didn't understand the picture. I didn't know what I was doing. And I started out, I tried to be polite. So I said to him, John, I just want to say this. I'd like to work with you again as an actor. But as a director, never. Do you hear what I'm saying? Never. <laughs> Never use, and then I went. <laughs> I went. <laughs> Did you know he said that? Had you heard him that story before? <laughs> you were sitting there. Boy, are you kidding? Yeah. Huh. Uh, it was a really. Would moment. you have appealed the same thing? About John? No. I, you I, feel when, the way John came up, when John came up to direct me, I'd say, "Get away! Get away!" Get away. I know, I know, I know. But Peter wanted John. He used to yeah, chase John right. to get directed. He used to have to chase him. John didn't want to direct him. Yeah. <laughs> not only that, he, he wouldn't, uh, not only did he not give direction, because he said, I gave you the part. Don't ask me. You, as an actor, should know more about this character than anybody now in the world. It's for you to bring it to life. But the other thing was, 
he wouldn't let you talk to any other of the actors about about oh, their yeah. part or this or oh, about yeah. the script yeah. at all. Oh, yeah. He wanted it just to happen on, and you and it did because you didn't know what anybody was going to do, and it would just happen on film. That way, it was a very interesting way of working. Did he like acting? He I liked, don't know. He liked acting in Husbands. He was so... He, yes, he, he had loved... the time of his life. He loved that. But I, I mean, because, uh, you know, I think John works, worked the way he worked with actors because that is the way he had wanted to be treated as an actor and was never. Mm. You're and right, think, man. That's right. So yes, I sir. think he created this environment of freedom, setting an actor up to be free, to become as good as he was, not better than he, he didn't want you to be better than you are. He never put pressure on you. He wanted you to be as good as you were. So he would set the climate for it, and he'd let you swim by yourself. Of all of the performances he got out of you, which is the best? Are all I, the performances you say, gave but, him? But I, you know, I wouldn't really be able to judge it from any, except which, for myself. Which was the most satisfying for you? The woman under the influence yes. was my favorite. Because it was a tour de force. And it was the first time I had really worked like that. Um, like? The freedom. In the first place, it wasn't for a studio. People say independent movies, and still someone has to put the money up. And when someone puts the money up, they always have something to say. So there isn't a total freedom. Um, we had an advantage in that we both had other careers and we were both actors so that when we ran out of money which was just about all the time <laughs> we would stop and go and do a, a movie for somebody else yeah. to bring the money and so we were able make to yeah. to make our movies and also yeah. uh, in that when uh, uh, Peter and uh, his wife Alice put up half the money in Woman Under the Influence so we worked totally freely and it, it, it's it's um, you don't realize how much you miss freedom until until you have some. That's right. Oh yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, tell me about his camera work. He's going to talk about it in this clip we're going to use about how he used the camera. I think John was interested mainly in the performances and whatever it took to get the performances, wherever the camera would best show off the performances is how he shot it. Uh, he, he wasn't... Um, he, he wasn't a stylist. Uh, no, it, not that way, no. He wasn't uh, picky about it, you know. He didn't mind it if it was, it was a little out of focus. He used to or, say, when I hear a director say, uh, <laughs> describe a shot, he, he set up and said, I want to vomit, he said. <laughs> <laughs> he hated the people who talked about shots. I did such a shot yesterday. I put the camera on the hill. And I saw that. That was not John. Hated it. I hated it. Yeah. Hated it. All right, here he is. Uh, take a look at this. This is a series called Filmmakers of Our Time. You know what we do? We would bet. Yeah. We would bet that we would shoot the best shot, you know. Yeah. I, so won. I won all the time. He won all the time. <laughs> but uh, only because... Uh, he's stronger or something because <laughs> the camera gets heavy as you know yourself but here, here's we had a shot we we're lying on the floor like this see and we had the camera this way you know and now we're shooting through the door the door closes we zoom we pull back here like this now pick me up George over this way <laughs> so and we had now, now he has to like, pick like me this. up right go ahead <laughs> and all through the house right so this is what we had to do in the picture to get things because we had no dollies, no tracks. And this is one of the best handheld operators in the world. With all due respect to you. That, that's because I don't breathe for 10 minutes. Like he doesn't this. breathe for 10 minutes. We kill him. <laughs> then we restore him back to life later. <laughs> See, and holding a handheld camera, you know that you can't breathe because if you breathe, the camera jiggles, huh? So we don't do that. We don't breathe. Water. Yeah. Every time you see that, you must uh, water. Yeah, forget about it. Yeah. Hey, boy, you can see it. You, you can see the yeah. life force. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It wasn't anybody like John. Nobody. No. Nobody. I never saw the guy. You know, I knew he was under pressure often. 
having financial problems, this I never saw him show it. No. Never. Never showed the pressure no. not having the money. No. Um, when he was when he was very ill. Yeah. I remember you know, he never complained about it. No. And he only made one comment about the whole thing. <laughs> I can't quite say it the way he said it, but it was like this. If they can't take a joke. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him, John, if I had what you have, I'd be in a deep, deep melancholy, or if not a profound depression. I said, how do you do it? How do you keep your, your spirit up? He says, what can I do about it? Yeah. And that was his attitude. What can you do about it? But that must have been very hard for you to see that. Yes, it was hard for yeah. all of us. Yeah. But he made it as easy as possible. Yeah, he sure did. He sure did. Unbelievable. How old was he when he died? He was 59. He would have been, let's see, he, was, he died in February. He would have been 60 at the end of the year, December. He'd be, he'd be 74 now. Yeah. Roll tape. This is John again talking about, from the same series, I think, talking about independent filmmaking. Here it is. Uh, half of the Half of the battle to, to make a, a good film in the United States, a free film, when I say good film, it's a free film. Whether it's good or bad, we don't know. But we'll put a year in for no money, for no anything, simply because there's a, an expression that has to be said. Now, we don't have any reverence for this expression. We don't believe it's a church. We have to have a good time, otherwise we die. <laughs> no, no, tell me something, John. Uh, uh, you say without money, but still you have to, you have to, to buy all, all that material, you, you have to eat twice a day. Yeah, well, you America to... lives on the credit plan, you know, uh, so, I mean, how much does this cost, you know, paper, to do the hard work, and how much does the, uh, reels cost? We get it all from the major studios. They help us destroy them. That's the way we work. <laughs> because if we make a good film, they will only suffer. And as they suffer, they come and they say, please make films for us. And we say, no, we don't want to make films for you. <laughs> hip, hip, hooray. Peter, what did he change? Well, I, I think In John and Brando changed acting. I think John uh, Shadows was the first really independent American film. I think it's the independent film, what is called independent film, begins with John. He was a hero to all the filmmakers, wasn't he? Yeah. I think so. You know, I mean, they really said, you're yeah. doing what we wish we had the courage to do, which yeah. is make the kind of films we want to make, mm -hmm. rather than the kind of films. Peter? Absolutely true. I mean, the I mean, only, the only other listed. person in American movies who used his own bread to make movies was Orson Welles. It was Orson and John. That was yeah. it. Until it still is today. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. You know, acting in movies, using the money to pay for the movies. Um, Shadows. Tell me about Shadows. Shadows, you know, I never saw. I still haven't seen it. I'm going to see it now. So the first thing I saw of John's, he invited me to, he had an idea. He said, I got an idea we can do a picture together. Come down to the, uh, to the downtown L.A. There's a midnight screening of a picture I just made. So I went. People were sitting in the aisles on the floor. I was going to, I was going to leave. I said, I'm not going to sit in the aisles. But the picture started. I looked around. I saw things right away. I was, Which one was, was looking faces? at faces. Faces yeah. I was looking at. At, at, at something I'd never seen before. It seemed unlit, it seemed unacted, it seemed unwritten, I don't know. It, it was unbelievable. It Unprofessional? Was unbelievable. <laughs> One of the things John did, you know, was he would dictate his scripts. He, the first yeah. draft, he would, he would actually dictate it. So he'd sort of play the part. To make sure that it had, it, it came out of his mouth rather than sort I, of I guess of, so. That's right. he, 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 yeah. It had a rhythm to it. And, and he used the uh, rehearsal to rewrite. Yeah. There would always be a secretary that went, and on his feet, he would rewrite. Yeah. He would rewrite what wasn't working, what uh, yeah. We're going to see another clip from Shadows. Here it is. Remember, you told me to get out. Look, look. Will you, will you leave? Will you leave before I do something I don't want to do right now? You just get out of here. Go ahead. But you remember, you told me to get out of here. Will you get out of the house? That's, that's Shadows. A, a woman under the influence. You were nominated for Golden Globe, Academy Award, both. <laughs> You yes, I won the Golden Globe, and, and I was nominated for the... Um, tell me who was Maple. Maple Longetti was... was uh, Best part you ever had. 
Yes, it was, it was written so beautifully. It's just a woman. Oh, you know, you think you can't be loved enough. Yeah. But sometimes someone loves you so much it just about drives you crazy. And I think that's what Mabel did to Nick. She, she only wanted to please him. She only, everything in her life was, was devoted to him. And, and I think it just overwhelmed him. He just couldn't stand it after a while. And, and uh, she loved her kids that way. She, and she was a, a naturally sort of eccentric person. And I had never thought of that before. But I've seen it a lot in my life now. Where, where something that you would think would be so desirable, like someone loving you, too much of it will ruin it. And that was that was a great deal of, of Mabel. He liked making movies about love. All of his movies really were about, about love. love. Yes. Here is Woman Under the Influence. I love those guys. I love them. I love anybody you bring in a house, Nick. I, I know that. I want them to feel comfortable. I want them to feel... They just sit there like a bunch of... What the hell are you talking about? You didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong? Unbelievable. Oh, it's beautiful. Unbelievable. Beautiful. Beautiful. You are some kind of beautiful, too. <laughs> uh, Peter Bogdanovich's book is called Who the Hell's In It? Portraits and Conversation from Stella Adler to John Wayne. Ben Gazzara in the moment is his life as an actor. Um, if you love movies and if you love the creative act of putting them together as an actor and a director and a writer, uh, read this. Uh, and especially look at the work including the documentary of John Cassavetes, uh, friend, friend, husband. Um, I could spend a lot of time with these people because it is, for them, more than a profession and more than a job, uh, as it was for John Cassavetes. His work here now on DVD on a Criterion Collection, I thank you for joining me. Thank you, Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.